All right, so we're in a series called Blessed Families. And I talked last weekend about the broken family. Uh, this weekend, I want to talk about the blessed marriage. Uh, so we will be talking about blessed husbands and blessed wives, um, and then blessed sons and daughters, uh, whether they're young or whether they're adults, we'll be talking about that some. But we're going to talk about the blessed marriage. Marriage is under attack in our country and all over the world. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, there's a statistic. Uh, let me make sure I get it exactly right here. 1930, in 1930, 83% of adult Americans in America were married. Today, 49.7% are married. And I want to show you why Satan hates marriage so much. And I want to show you in Matthew 19 what I believe to be the most in-depth passage on marriage in the Bible. Now, that's saying a lot because most would believe it's Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm not downplaying Ephesians 5. I'm not downplaying that at all. That's an extremely important chapter on marriage. But in Matthew 19, we have a question being asked about marriage and divorce, and Jesus himself gives the answer. Remember, Jesus is God. So this is God's answer about marriage and divorce. I also want to make another statement. Um, if you've experienced a divorce, the, uh, in no way, do I ever want you to feel condemnation? No way at all. Uh, I'm going to say something, and I'll say it a little differently than the way you've heard it, and I'll explain it. But for Debbie, there go I. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. The saying and expression is, which I agree with, and I think it's a great expression, is but for the grace of God, there go I. I agree with that, that God's grace has played a huge part in our marriage. I agree with that. But some could hear that who have experienced divorce and say, well, son, this guy said, but for the grace of God, there go I. I would be divorced also. And so they might think, well, where was the grace of God in my situation? You see what I'm saying? And you have to understand that when it comes to marriage, it takes two people. So the reason I'm saying that is yes, but for the grace of God and Debbie, I would be divorced because Debbie uh, could have divorced me on several occasions. I mean, I, 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 I was a jerk. Um, I was a chauvinist. Uh, I verbally abused her in my 20s. I said and did stupid things. Uh, she could have divorced me. So, but for Debbie and the grace of God, I, I, would, be, I would have experienced divorce as well. Are, are y'all following me? So if you've experienced divorce, this is a no condemnation message. But I want to show you what the Bible says about marriage and divorce and how important marriage is in the Bible. And personally, I think most people don't realize how serious God is about marriage. And I want to show you why. He tells us why. In other words, he gives us the reason why marriage is so important. He gives us the reason. And it's God himself. It's, it's in red. I like to say that. It's in red. So it's Jesus talking, all right? So Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Now, I'm going to stop just for a moment to make a comment about this. The word just in any version that you read, if it's in that version or that translation, is italicized. When you see a word italicized in the Bible, it means it's not in the original language, but the translators added it to help us understand the passage better. It doesn't take away from the passage, it should just add to our understanding of the passage. The reason I say that is, this is the question they actually asked. Is there any, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Now, they, so they didn't say just, for any reason. And the Greek word, any, is an exclusive Greek word, which means any reason at all. In other words, uh, New, New American Standard actually translates it this way. It says, 
is it lawful for a man? Please think about this. They're asking Jesus this question. They're asking God this question. Is it lawful? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Everyone, everyone get this? Are y'all with me? Are y'all okay? I know this is a touchy subject, but come on, smile, okay? <laughs> this is phenomenal. If you want to know the answer to this question, here it is right here. They asked Jesus. They asked the Son of God this question. Okay, here's his answer. Verse four, and he answered, said to them, are you crazy? No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> but that's kind of what he's implying. Here's what he says. Have you not read? In other words, have you never read the Bible yourself? If you'd read the Bible, you wouldn't have even need to ask me this question. Watch. Have you not read that he who made them, them, that's husband and wife, male and female, at the beginning, that's before the fall, before the broken family came in, like I talked about last week, and then it's quotations now, because he's quoting Genesis 1, 26 and 27, made them male and female. And he said, for this reason, now we're going to come back to that because there's a reason why he's talking about marriage and divorce and why uh, God would not have permitted divorce in the beginning. Okay, there's a reason, okay? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. This word joined is the word you use when you yoke animals together. And by the way, it means equally yoked. That means each person does his share. That's the way, only way marriage works. I heard someone say one time, marriage is 50-50. It's not, it's 100-100. It takes 100% commitment on both parts. Okay, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be equally yoked to his wife, and the two shall become one. Now, I got I to stop again. Do you think that Jesus um, exaggerates? Do you? That shouldn't take you that long to answer that question. <laughs> Do you think he lies? Do you think that he stretches the truth? Jesus said, the two, the two, watch this, the two become one. The two become one. They become one. They become one flesh. Therefore, I remember hearing an old preacher one time, and he said, anytime you see the word therefore, you need to look to see what it's there for. Therefore, what God has joined together, that made one, let not man, that would be the husband as well. This is asking about a husband. Can a husband divorce his wife for any reason? Let not man or any man separate. Okay, this is the answer to the question that they asked. Here's my problem. He go, they, they ask another question, which we're going to read in a moment. And then he answers that question. But a lot of people will give that answer to this question. Are you following me? I don't know if you're how familiar you are with this passage and the teaching of marriage and divorce. But many people will say, will give the next answer as his answer to this question. But that's not his answer to this question. They said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all. And he said, have you not read? Have you not read that when God made them in the beginning, he made them male and female, and a man will leave his father and mother and be joined equally yoked to his wife, and the two will become one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not any person in the world separate that. That's his answer. It's over at that point. That's his answer. 
Then they ask another question, okay? And then he answers that question. So, but his question right now is, let, let me just sum it up. No. That's his answer. No, it's not. That's what he's saying. No. The two have become one. God's joined them together. Okay? Now watch the next one. They said to him, why then did Moses command, notice this word command, to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He, Jesus, said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Not until sin came in this world. Because of the hardness of your heart. Now listen to me carefully. Please, please hear me again. I've, I've, I've got to speak the truth and please don't think I'm trying to attack someone if they experience this. But I will say this. In every divorce, there is at least one person with a hard heart. Sometimes there are two, but most times there's really just one that has a hard heart. And here's what he said. They said Moses commanded, commanded to give a certificate of divorce. He said Moses permitted you to put your wife away to divorce your wife uh, if you had a hard heart, men, if you have a hard heart. And here's what, here's what was going on at the time when this, when Moses, when this became a part of the law. Men were marrying other women and neglecting their first wife and abusing her and actually letting other men abuse her and not letting her go free. And so Moses, then it became a part of the law. Moses then made a commandment, give her a certificate of divorce and maybe another man will treat her like the queen and the princess of God that she really is. That's where this came from. That's where this was came from, okay? So I want you to notice something, by the way. Moses, in biblical language, biblical interpretation, hermeneutics, exegesis, all those words I love, okay, Moses represents the law and Jesus represents grace. Let, let me show you the verse. So, you know, John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Okay, here's my point. Jesus said, they said, is it lawful? Is it lawful? for a man to divorce his wife. Jesus said, no, it's not. They said, well, Moses said you could. He said, uh-huh, under the law, you can. Okay, listen. We would think it's the opposite. We would think that the law said you're not supposed to divorce and that grace says it's okay. Are you all following me? That, this is so much better than your, your, you should just be going, oh, 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 oh. this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. We would think that the law says, no, you can't do that, but grace says, hey, listen, you're under grace, it's okay. No, it's the opposite. Grace says, no, you're in a covenant and you work it out. Law says, yeah, you got a hard heart, so just let her go. Are, are y'all following? <laughs> this is Jesus, okay. So why, why? Okay, so Jesus said these three words, have you not read? that in the beginning, God made them male and female. And then he makes the statement, for this reason. Okay, what reason? What reason? Well, you got to go back to Genesis 1, but I'm going to tell you the reason, okay? So there are three things about a blessed marriage you need to know, okay? Number one, marriage represents God. Marriage represents God on this earth. So back in uh, that Matthew 19 again, and he answered and said, have you not read that he who made them the game made them male and female for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother be joined. Okay, so now we've got to go back to Genesis 1. Okay, then God said, verse 26, let us make man, is us singular or plural? Plural. So three in one. Let us make man, man and that word remember is Adam, which means mankind. Let us make mankind, not male, not, no, he didn't say, let us make male in our image. He said, let us make mankind, male and female. Let us, let us make mankind in our image, our is plural, according to our plural likeness. And let them, plural, 
male and female, had dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, ever creeping and creeps on the earth. So God created mankind, again, that's the word here in the Hebrew, mankind, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Hear me, male and female is the image of God. But not just any man or any woman, a husband and a wife. Because Adam and Eve weren't living in sin, okay? We know that. The sin was eating from the tree they weren't supposed to. The other stuff they were doing was fun. But that wasn't sin, okay? Because they were married, So when God wanted to create a portrait of himself on this earth, he created the marriage. That's what you got to understand. God said, let's put our image, our likeness on the earth. And he put a married couple. That, That is the image of God, okay? Marriage is the image of God. Listen, male is not the image of God. And all the women can say, praise God. Male is not the image of God. Male and female is the image of God. A marriage is God. You want to know why Satan hates marriage so much? Because it's the image of God on this earth. That's why. Satan, listen to this. Think about this. Satan did not attack Adam. He did not attack until the image of God appeared on the earth. That's when he got scared. He wasn't scared of man by himself. He was scared when God showed up. When he looked at God, he saw the image of God, but he didn't see it in Adam. He saw it in Adam and Eve. Are are y'all following me? This is phenomenal. That's when he got mad. Okay, so God is a triune God. I know that's a theological word, but what that means is three in one. Let me show you again this little illustration. Okay, God is three, watch this, three in one. In other words, you can look at God and you see God, he's one. But if you look closely, you'll see three persons, right? Okay, but now some people say, well now, if he created male and female and that's his image, his image is three in one, but marriage is two in one. That's where you're completely missing it because marriage is a husband, a wife, and God. That is the blessed marriage. That is the blessed marriage. And that's the only way marriage works. Three in one. And you get three in one, and hell can't stand against you. You make sure God's in your marriage. So marriage is the image of God on this earth. Um, When a lost couple comes into our home, my home and Debbie's home, our home, they should leave scratching their heads. They should say, that's amazing. I I saw something, I can't really explain it, but I'm going to try to. I saw two individuals, yet it seemed like they were just one. I mean, they were completely different persons, but they were one. You know, she was sweet and he was a jerk, but they were one. (laughs) This is why Satan hates marriage. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, Pastor Robert, I'm getting a little bothered here because I'm not married. I'm single. So you're saying I can't represent God on the earth? No, that's point two. Because God came to this earth Name, and his name was Jesus, and he was single for 33 years. And he represented the Father. So even if you're not married, you can still represent the Father, but we're going to get to point two, okay? Right now, I'm harping on the married people, okay? So just, I'll harp on you in a minute. I'll get you, but I'm getting them right now. Okay? So they should leave and say, they're, they are individuals, but they're in unity. Do you you realize that the world knows nothing about this? Because what they say is, no, you need to be your person and he needs to be his person. Y'all and the twain never meet. No, you need to be one, even though you're still two different persons. Are y'all following me? Here's another thing. 
equality, but with order. And the world doesn't understand that either. They say, well, if one's the leader, then how can you be equal? Well, that was never a problem with God. It's all through Scripture. All through Scripture, in that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but God the Father is the leader. And I'm going to go more into this later, but if you think about a couple dancing, you know, and the lights are down, and there's one couple in the middle of the floor, and everybody's standing around the room, and the spotlight's on them, they are moving in perfect harmony and unity. But if you talk to any dance instructor, one of them's leading. Right? But you really don't even, you clearly can't even tell it because of that. And I'm going to talk about that it's servant leadership. When I was in my 20s, I thought me being the leader meant that I was the boss. I really did. I remember one time I was back in the bedroom and Debbie said to me, come out here and do these dishes. And I didn't do it. I thought, you know, I'm the boss. And I stayed right there and I finished my ironing first. (laughs) You know, sometimes, man, you just got to put your foot down. Okay, all right. So marriage represents God. That's number one. Here's number two. Marriage represents Christ and the church. This is why marriage is so important. It represents Christ's church. Okay, here's the Ephesians 5 passage. Watch what three words it starts with, and watch what verse it again quotes from Genesis. Ephesians 5, verse 31. For this reason, in other words, that we're the image bearers of God on the earth. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, glued to his wife. He's not glued to his parents anymore. He's glued to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife. Now, this is talking to the men as himself, and now talking to the women, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So the two of you together are representing the Trinity, but as a, as a couple now, or as a, a man or a woman, as a man, you're representing Christ. And as a woman, you're representing the church. So again, let's talk about now lost, someone lost. You're trying to win them to the Lord. So you're trying to win a guy, let's say husbands, I'll start with you. Then ladies, I'll get to you. Husbands, I'll start with you. Let's say that you're trying to win Joe to the Lord. And so Joe says to you, well, if I give my life to the Lord, what's my life going to be like after I give my life to the Lord? And what, How is God going to treat me if I give him control of my life? This is your answer. Well, you know the way I treat my wife? God is going to treat you just like I treat my wife. Would you like to be saved? (laughs) Yeah, let's get honest. (laughs) What would Joe say? Uh, God's going to treat me like you treat your wife? I I don't want to be saved. (laughs) I don't want to be laughed at. I don't want to be put down. I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to be talked about behind my back. And I don't want to be ordered around. And we're going to talk about servant leadership. But sir, if that's what you think marriage is, you're a horrible example of Jesus. And sometimes I just say things just straight out, don't I? I just, it even surprises me. I think, well, you just said that kind of straight up there. But what Joe should say is, You mean I'm going to be loved, and I'm going to be honored, and I'm going to be treated like royalty? Yes, I want to accept Jesus Christ. If if Jesus treats me like you treat your wife, I'd love to be saved. See, we represent Christ. Okay, ladies, it's your turn. (laughs) So let's say you're talking to another lady, and she says, you know, um, I don't really know how to pray. I don't know how to talk to the Lord. And so you say, well, let me use the example in Scripture. If you want to know how to talk to the Lord, you talk to the Lord the same way that I talk to my husband. (laughs) What's she going to say? You mean I can cuss him out? (laughs) 
You mean I can be disrespectful? You mean I can talk about his weaknesses to everybody else? Please hear me. Marriage is a lot more important than you think. This is why Jesus got upset when they said, is it okay to divorce? You know what he was thinking? Would it be okay for the Trinity to divorce? Have you not read that you represent us on this earth? That, and you not only represent the Trinity, you represent me and the church. That's what Ephesians 5 says. Marriage, a husband and wife, represents Christ and the church. I talked a moment ago about um, equality. There's never been an issue of equality with the Bible. If anyone thinks that, that there is or that the Bible is outdated or old-fashioned, the things that says about marriage, you don't know the Bible. You really don't. And you're not very good at, at exegeting the Bible because there's never been a, 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 a problem with equality in God's eyes. Never. There's no male nor female in Christ. <laughs> That's a scripture. There's no male or female. Now, there has been a, a problem with equality in our society, and there's no doubt about that. For thousands of years, women have been mistreated, thousands of years. But if someone asked me a while back, I was doing a program on marriage, and uh, I, I just had this come to me, just kind of shocked him. This, and this guy said, well, do you think men and women are equal? And I said, no, I don't. I think women are smarter. And I'm personally, I'm mad about it. <clears throat> And I just wanted to just, just, just joke with you for a little bit, all right? That's okay. But I want to say to the young men here, women will mess with you. They will mess with your mind. When you get married, they start messing with you immediately. A man will be all dressed up, about to go out, and a woman will say, Are you going to wear that? Now listen to me, guys. There's nothing wrong with what you got on. <laughs> She's just messing with you. And he messes with you so much that a man will say something like, no, I was just going to go out and get the mail, come back in and change. <laughs> Pretty soon, you got a grown man walking out of the closet in his underwear. Honey, do these pants go with this shirt? <laughs> Now, this is what Debbie did to me. Debbie says to me, just sit on the bed. Just sit on the bed, and after I get dressed, I will pick something out for you. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the bed in my underwear with the children saying, we're going to get dressed. <laughs> Mama's going to make us look good. <clears throat> so are we equal? No. They're a lot smarter than we are. All right. So here's number three. Third thing marriage represents. Marriage represents covenant. Covenant. You, are you catching how important marriage is to God? It rep, it's his image on the earth. It represents Christ and the church. And it represents covenant. In Malachi, he's telling them why he's not accepting their offerings. The first reason, by the way, is their family. Their family's out of order. Actually, their faith is out of order. The second reason is their family. And the third reason is their finances. That's where we get into the part of tithing. But this, this is the family part. So he's telling them, I'm not receiving your, your worship or your offerings. And they said, Malachi 2.14, yet you say, for what reason? It's amazing that the other two passages also begin with, for this reason. Now they're saying, for what reason are you not accepting our offerings? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you've dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and the wife and your wife by covenant. Pastor Jimmy Evans does one of the best teachings in the world on the difference between a covenant and a contract. And let me just stick it up here for you. In a contract, we protect our rights and we limit our responsibilities. Think about if you're buying a house or you're entering into a business agreement. In a contract, you're trying to protect your rights, right? And you're trying to limit your responsibilities. A covenant is just the opposite. In a covenant, we give up our rights and we pick up our responsibilities. And this is the example to the world. See, see, again, if a lost person says, 
how do I know that God will keep his word to me? You know what you should say? You should say, look at how my wife and I have kept our word. Because see, we entered into a covenant too. And by the way, let me just remind you of the covenant that you entered into if you're married. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. Here's one. For better. What? Because <laughs> I've done a lot of marriage counseling. People say, well, it's really gotten bad. Uh-huh. That's what you signed up for. <laughs> and then you just couldn't shut up. You went on and said, till death do us part. <laughs> That's the covenant union. Okay. But it is an example. It is uh, uh, um, an example, I guess you say, of the new covenant, not the old covenant. So let me explain the difference, all right, between the Mosaic Covenant and the New Covenant, which is a pattern after the Abrahamic Covenant based on faith, okay? So in the Mosaic Covenant, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, okay? But God said, let's say Israel, nation of Israel there, God's here. God said, I'm going to enter into a covenant with you, and in a covenant, each person has a part to do. Each side has a part. My part is, and this is, I'm going to sum it up, protect, provide, and bless, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to provide for you, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be your father, I'm going to love you, never leave you, never forsake you. I'm going to, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to provide for you. Uh, okay, your part is, let me see, let me see if I remember this exactly. Oh yeah, I remember now. Your part is to be perfect. Just, just read, read the old covenant. You're, you're, you are to be perfect, never mess up, and uh, do Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy while you're at it. That's what he told them. Leviticus means the law. It means the priesthood law. Deuteronomy means the second law, the law of second time. Okay. Um, so, the, and, and here's what's amazing. Israel said, okay, just like they said, we will do all the words of this covenant. They said. And, and by the way, they, they were breaking it before Moses could even get down off the mountain. They were already breaking it. So, I, and here, here's the thing. You say, well, why did God even give them the law in the first place? One is to show the standard of perfection and a moral standard. But the second reason God gave the law, when you read Romans and Galatians, was to frustrate us to come to Christ. And if you don't think you'd get frustrated, read Leviticus. <laughs> there is one whole chapter on what you have to do if you get a scab. A whole chapter on it. And I personally, I think God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had a blast right yet. I think they said, let's say that if they do this, they have to wait three days before they can go to church. Say seven, seven. They'll never do seven. <laughs> because he never wanted a legalistic relationship. He always wanted a love relationship. Always. He wanted us to get so frustrated, we'd say, I just want to have a relationship with him. He'd say, it's great. It's all I wanted all along. So that was the first covenant. Here's the new covenant, though. God said, I'm going to love you. I'm going to protect you, provide for you, bless you. I'm going to be your father. That's my part. Your part is, you know what? Um, son, son, would you come over here, Jesus? Would you come here? And the son walks over. The Lord says, uh, Jesus, this is Robert. Robert's not going to be able to keep the covenant. So, son, I was wondering if you would go to the earth and if you would fulfill the covenant for Robert. And you'd live the life that he can't live. And I also need you to die the death that he should die. And Jesus said, okay, I'll do it. And then the father said to me, do you believe that Jesus lived the life that you couldn't live and he died the death that you should have died? And in a motel room when I was 19 years old, I said, yes, I believe it. And the father said, you're in the covenant now. And you're my son, and I will never leave you nor forsake you.
Never. Never. That's what marriage is. Listen, that even if my spouse doesn't keep her end of the covenant, I'll keep my end of it. That's marriage. And we're telling the world, this is what God's like. He is a covenant-keeping God. That is why Satan hates marriage. Because it's the image of God on this earth, it represents Christ in the church, and it represents the new covenant. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Again, I just want to say, don't ever come to church and hear condemnation. If you do, it could be partly my fault. I might have said something in a way I shouldn't have said it, and and I'm a human, and I hope I don't ever do that, but it could be. But it could also be that the enemy is trying to bring out your faults or your failures from the past, and he's just trying to make you feel bad, even in church. So don't ever listen to condemnation, okay? So don't feel that way. That's why at the end of every message, we pray this little prayer. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? So I want you to take a moment. I know that in a church our size, we've got people struggling in their marriage. And you're not a bad person if you're struggling in your marriage because that's normal. It's normal as human beings to struggle. We live in a fallen world. Satan is attacking us. But it's also normal for Christians to ask for prayer. To get in a small group where they can talk with others and be mentored and be taught God's word and and live it out. Church is not just about coming on the weekend and hearing God's word and worshiping him, which which is a big part of church. But it's also getting involved in the church where you attend and taking opportunity of the classes and the relationships that are offered there. So if you're going through a difficulty, we're gonna have a time to pray with you, but I wanna recommend to you to follow up. I mean, take advantage of the classes we offer. Get in a small group, get in relationship. Let, Let the Lord help you work through this thing. So don't leave condemned if you're going through a difficulty. But let the Holy Spirit speak to you today and tell you what he's trying to say to you through this message. And then I just, I just want us to, to pray with you. I want you, if you need prayer for any area, and please, 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 don't ever feel embarrassed. Maybe you say to your spouse, could we go and just let someone help us and pray with us in our marriage? It doesn't mean you're bad people. It means you're human. So if you need prayer for any area of your life, in just a moment, every campus, we're gonna have one more worship song. We ask that no one leave during this time, simply because, unless you have an emergency, we understand that, but because this is part of church and it's an important part of church. And we'll take a few moments and allow people to come forward for prayer, and then we'll come back up, we'll dismiss the service, but we'll hang around. Many times it's 15 or 20 minutes after the service praying with people. So if you need prayer for any reason at all, no matter which campus you're attending or which service you're attending, if you need prayer, as soon as we stand in worship, you just stand up, step out, come to the front, and just let us pray with you, all right? Holy Spirit, I pray you'll draw every person from every campus that needs any type of prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen.